Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. And now, here is your host, the lovely, delightful, insightful, and all-around great gal, Ms. Barbara DeLong. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. I have Ken Quiet-Hawk to thank for that amazing um, intro. He and his wife um, are Native storytellers, and they have, they, they are purveyors of some of the most magical stories you could ever imagine. Uh, Native storytellers are a skill and a talent that that is not as well and open out there as it used to be. Their website is nativestorytellers.com. I encourage you to go to it, to listen to some of their stories, to buy their CDs, because they are preserving a tradition that has kept history alive for thousands and thousands of years. As a matter of fact, more of history than uh, a lot of people like to think. Uh, My guest tonight is someone who is trying to do the exact same thing. I have uh, Ross Hamilton with me tonight, and he has been at the forefront of bringing understanding to some of the magic that our continent has to share. He has written two books. Uh, well, he's probably written more than that, but I've been, I have read two of his books. One of them is The Mystery of the Serpent Mound, which we will be talking about, and the other is A Tradition of Giants, The Elite Social Hierarchy of American Prehistory. Now, the first book, Mystery of the Serpent Mound, is on Amazon. The second book is at academia.edu, and you can download it. And for anyone who even thinks they might be interested in giants, this is an absolute must-read. Uh, the the link to them um, are are in the write-up for the show, and they will be also on the YouTube channel, so you can click to them. I strongly, 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 after you listen to the show, of course, encourage you to to get these books and read them. The mysterious Serpent Mound in the Ohio Valley is a masterpiece of prehistoric architecture. Its enormous size alone inspires awe and reverence. Even deeper meanings may be hidden in the dimensions and lost functions of this ancient religious structure. Researcher Ross Hamilton has uncovered multiple layers of secrets hidden within the earthworks of the Serpent Mound, and his discoveries contribute to a new understanding of prehistoric spiritual science and engineering. Ross has been fascinated by American Indian history from childhood. He's devoted his life to bringing to light the lost history of the North American continent. He's worked with archivist, oh, activist, sorry, (laughs) Vin Deloria, Jr., the former executive director of the National Congress of American Indians, and Floyd Red Crow Westerman, and Iroquois Chief Jake Swamp. He has brought together material about our continent that lets you know that it has a history as rich and as great and as mysterious as all of those in Europe and Asia. 
our continent was flooded with amazing people. And the fact that we don't teach our children about them, the fact that we have ignored their existence, unfortunately the fact that we have wantonly destroyed a lot of the artifacts that remind us of that time is a sadness, but, but they're still out there and they there there are still hints of the history that is there and to to study ancient history of of areas that aren't your own before you know about the richness that is where you live is a very sad thing and we need to remember it we need to teach it we need to become a part of it so that it, it enriches our own realities as well so i'm so delighted that ross is here and Russ, welcome to the show. Hey, Barbara, it's nice to be here. Cold weather we're having, so it's good to uh, kind of curl up by the fire. Yeah, I'm at seven degrees. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely getting getting chillies tonight. That's for sure. I think we're, I, you know, it, we're going below zero again tonight. So, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. That Wait. said. You know, there were there were Native Americans that were living in these areas thousands of years ago. How did they survive this weather? Well, you know, I was talking to somebody about that just the other day. I forgot who I was talking to, but uh, the um, the Iroquois Confederation um, of five tribes, when we first met them, they uh, weren't living in teepees. They were they were living in houses that were uh, better than, than log cabins. They had doors and windows, and uh, they uh, they also had the longhouse. But uh-huh. um, according to which one of the five tribes you talked to, the architectures were well designed to withstand winters. And uh, oftentimes the, they would create little towns so that uh, if somebody was lucky on the hunt, Especially up in the uh, in the Great Lakes area, where you know you get that lake effect snow and uh, nobody can go out, um, then everything was shared. Uh, so um, the uh, the winters were probably just as harsh then as they are now, at least uh, up in that area. So um, they uh, lived very close to nature and. Um, you know, Barbara, you can you can hear the sound of the earth in those really deep, silent winter nights. Uh-huh. And the people lived so close to nature that they could hear hear her what I call the her murmuring axial rhythms. I've had friends that uh, uh, would leave the city and go up into Canada at the end of summer when it was already getting kind of chilly. And they said that you can hear the earth like a great millstone moving on its axis uh, up there at night. And it's almost a little religious. It is a religious experience. Well, the Indians, the native people, because they depended on the earth and lived so close to her, they were rewarded by being absorbed at her pulse and her sound. And when you give yourself to Mother Earth, she responds by telling you her secrets and how to survive uh, and how to understand the mysteries and the language of animals and and, uh, the changing of the seasons. They saw spirit in everything. Everything was a Manitou, which... um, if we're lucky, we'll be able to get that deep into this conversation that we can talk a lot more about um, about the Manitou system that uh, Native people had east of the Mississippi uh, in prehistoric times. Uh, well, there was also, once a... also, though, they they were they were a community. They weren't isolate, and because of the fact that they were a community and they worked together and they ate together, basically, and they survive together they had the group energy and when you have the group energy you have a a greater ability to hear the earth energy to feel the earth energy to become one with it so that 
the fact that we are also isolated today and we've taken ourselves away from that kind of a sharing with nature um, is something we really need to return to. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, the sound is actually created by the atoms themselves. And the old philosophers of Greece and Egypt, uh, from prehistory, we hear that the word is heard on the right side of the head at first. And um, you can you can hear it even if you stop cock your ears. And uh, in the in the dead of the night, um, the life of of the world and the music of the spheres comes to life, and it's food for the soul. the The soul um, I was initiated by a saint, a master saint from India, back in um, 1969. And uh, the saints will explain to you uh, the same thing that the that the wise uh, among the native people will explain to you, and that is that we listen within ourselves to the Creator. And when you get to that point where you need to listen every day, and when you get to the point where the tear gland functions every day because Tuning in to the sound tunes you into an ocean of love. It keeps you pure. It keeps you singular. And it reminds you that you are a drop in the ocean, uh, the endless ocean of consciousness. Now, I'm sure, Barbara, you being a bit of a philosopher yourself and an educator, that you've asked yourself the question at one time or another in your life, And I understand that the more times you ask yourself this question, the more you come closer to an understanding about yourself. And that question is, where did anything come from? How did the universe come to be? Whence did it spring? Now, of course, our physicists are asked that question because We think, oh, these are a bunch of smart guys and gals, and they can probably tell us. You know what they say? They say it's a big bang. Yeah. And (laughs) anybody that has an ounce of common sense knows that um, that idea of the big bang came about when they first discovered how to create an atomic bomb, which is Uh you take unstable material and you put it into a ball, right? And then you put a bunch of of pillars of steel against it coming from all directions. And you encase that in a steel sphere. And then you put an explosive charge all around that and wrap the whole thing up and then drop it from an airplane. And it destabilizes and sends into an inverted uh, hell that unstable plutonium. You only need a small amount of it, and it can, as we know, it can destroy a number of city blocks, flatten all the buildings. But the universe didn't come from a Big Bang. That, that, they were talking about the atomic bomb. That's, that's when they got that idea, because they had just been enlightened about how we can destroy a city with a single spark of energy. What the creator did, and the creator, of course, is formless, and has always existed before time. The creator Uh is consciousness. The universe was created as a sort of great orgasm out of the will of the knowledge of the existence of consciousness. In other words, the existence of the great mystery was able to understand that there is a true substance and that true substance is the nature in other words the 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 sort of tangible part of consciousness in india they call that sat that's the truth Uh sat guru is the true master Uh, sat yuga is the golden age sat is 
truth. And truth is a substance. So before anything was created, there existed consciousness and sat. And by some method of concentration, the consciousness created a vortex about itself, but not the kind of vortex that you can see, but a sort of will. This is the great mystery. How did the will transform the true substance into matter? And then this is this is something that that we should seek to understand because it takes us to the edge of our mental faculty. And the, the masters of spiritual science say, this is the great laugh, this is the great humor that the creator has. Because the human form, they say, is the highest in creation. All the planets of all, all the astral worlds, not, not as many as the physical world, but all the astral and many of the physical have man-like creatures, human-like creatures. There's no two races alike, and there's virtually an, an, a countless number because the universe, the great omniverse, is in the shape of the anthropomorph. And, and so that form was created in miniature for the soul, which is also made in the image of God, which is pure consciousness and a, like a spherical shape, to inhabit. So the soul sits in the sensorium, which is behind the two eyes, where the optic nerves meet. We're just about as big as a little baby, actually smaller than that. <laughs> yeah. And, but we're pure consciousness. And the masters say, know yourself. So... Self-knowledge is twofold. We can know ourselves as human beings. But God created the human being to master all of knowledge that has to do with matter. But when we go beyond matter, man doesn't have a clue. That becomes the, the realm of the knowledge that the soul understands and comprehends. And within the soul are all the faculties that are externalized in the human form. So in a manner of speaking, the soul is a seed from which the human form was created, sort of blown out, if you will. And that's why when you read in the first uh, book of, the, of, of Genesis, of the, of the Bible, you say that God blew through the atom, atom, and created a sort of inverted image of the soul in the man body. So my master he used to say, isn't the body a funny-shaped thing? It has two eyes, a nose, a mouth. It has the faculties you can touch and, and everything. But isn't it odd? And, and you have to agree with him because it is funny. And then he says to us, I've initiated you. Now I want you to do what I ask. And what's that, Master? What do you want? He says, rise above body consciousness. Well, how do you do that, Master? And he says, it's a necessity for us to be nonviolent and to learn to re invert our attention and focus to the seat of the soul and work out all the karmas that interrupt our communion with the soul and that which sustains the soul throughout eternity, which is the sound, that sound we were just talking about, the sound that sustains all the atoms. It's also at the heart of the soul. So the master gives us the word, and every religion has a different name for it, but all the founders of the faith talked about it the word or the logos in the Christian. Uh, the Muslims call it the water or the Abi Hayat. They have various names for it. Um, the, uh, the Sikhs call it Nam. Uh, the Buddhists refer to it as transcendental sound. 
And it goes on and on. There are probably a thousand different names for this unstruck music. Blavatsky called it the uh, sound of the silence. But once we start to listen to it, we naturally withdraw back to that point in the sensorium that allows us to begin to discover ourselves. And when we completely withdraw and become the soul sitting in the sensorium, then with any luck, the master will come and he'll take you out. He'll lift you up out of the body and relieve you. And it's like coming out of a sweat box. And we're just tiny little babies. <laughs> and, but we're immortal. And we have the flame of life and logos burning at our center. And then after you kind of take a fresh breath of omnipresence and you have the vision that you're allotted, mine was a heavenly city, uh, it better varies, then the master, with a great deal of love and grace, puts you back into the body, into the sensorium. And you notice that your blood is filled with light. And it takes a, a, a number of minutes to readjust to uh, this world. And, and you're never the same again, because this is what the masters have enjoined. No sutum. Man, know thyself. Uh -huh. And this refers to knowing what you really are. And that's what Yogananda meant when he founded Self-Realization Fellowship. We're not the body. The body is like a, an inverted version of the soul that the soul feels very comfortable in because it can easily extend itself and enliven all the nerves right from the brain into the tips of your toes. When death comes, we have to withdraw because the body gets old and it's mortal. And so Master says to us, learn to die so you can begin to live. So once he gives you that experience, then you start in earnest with your meditations. And in just 20 or 30 years, usually, it's taken me a little longer because I have a different destiny, but you can learn to rise above body consciousness every day, every uh -huh. single day. And uh, now I do it every day. I do it two or three times a day, but I understand you can do it 90 times, a 100 times a day. St. Paul said, I die daily. I die in Christ. I die three times daily. And that's when he you know, had the time to view the radiant form of the Lord. Uh -huh. And you get that as a bonus, as a boon, when you start to really get, get uh, masterful about withdrawing. Um, into the seat of the soul and lifting out of the body, you really get to really enjoy yourself every day, and it's really addictive. But um, <laughs> you cheat death. You know, you never die again. You never have to worry about climbing the walls when you're on your deathbed. You know, the cancer comes, and they can't cure it for some reason. And what are you going to do? And you're freaking out. And your whole family is worried about you and you don't have any peace of mind. So what do you do? You know, you, you make your peace with Jesus. You know, that's the best you can do because there's no power on earth that can save you. But what I'm saying is start now because life is short. Start now and learn to die. It's a science. And you don't have to be the member of any particular religion, but you can use religion like you told me earlier, Barbara as a stepping stone to uh -huh. real spirituality. And this real spirituality goes across the board to all faiths. Even the Jews have the ability oh, yeah. because they have the form. You know, uh, I say that in, in kind of tongue in cheek because uh, the Jews have a different belief system than the other mainstream well, religions. But uh, well, they do, but they don't. I mean, uh, at the at the very core, at the very basis of every religion is the golden rule. So that so that they all started at the same place. They just get there in slightly different ways. I agree. But but you know, the the element of listening is is so important, and 
you, you don't need to take hours and hours to do it, though. Though that's that's a good thing too. But uh, everybody will find their own way that that works for them too. It's not an absolute. You do it exactly the way your neighbor does, or or you know your your partner. It's it's finding your own bridge to that aspect of yourself that is divine, that is so important. And yeah, uh, the create. oracle of Del. The, the the Oracle of Delphi um over their over their um temple it said to know thyself. It's really yes. important. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, you you know who you are by who you have labeled yourself and identified yourself with, but to know the very core spirit of you is a completely different thing. What would you think, Barbara, if I told you that there was once a great country here where the United States and Canada is, the eastern United States, and it was oh, I would, a country. I would believe you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Native American people, although we destroyed most of the knowledge when we tore them apart and destroyed their culture, they said that there was once a great country here that was called Turtle Island. And uh, Turtle Island started on uh, on Mackinac Island uh, on top of Michigan. That was the original Turtle Island, Mackinac, and that means turtle. And that was that turned out to be like the Washington D.C. of a great country that stretched from the Hudson Bay down to the Gulf. It had a series of God kings. And it was at the time believed to have been New Atlantis. And this this country uh, was populated by a race of men and women who eventually spread coast to coast. And according to Native American tradition, and this is hard for us to believe, but just imagine a race of people that practiced the golden rule literally practiced it because they were so spiritually advanced that the great mystery to them was to the north. Now, I'm going way back in time, and for your listeners that are interested, uh, there's a book you can get on Google Books published in 1916, written by a Native American woman, self-published, named Lucy Thompson. And you might make a note of this one. It's called To the American Indian. That's the name of the book. And this book deals with a secret society that she and her father were really the last members of. And she was one of the tribes that was in the Northwest. And she said that for many millennia, they carried the the tradition of a people that once lived here that they referred to as the Wagas. And uh, their real name, as far as we can determine, was the Alihana. And they were, according to Native tradition, Cro-Magnon people. And uh, they were here when the first Native people arrived um, from the north and from the east, the Native people that had Asian blood. And they said that when they first arrived, this race lived here from coast to coast. And they had been here for untold millennia. Now, here's where it starts to get really interesting. We're assuming that the, these native people began to arrive just before the Holocene or around the beginning of the Holocene, which is 14,000, 15,000 years ago when the glaciers receded. But this, this race of people who Lucy Thompson says were white and fair-haired, white-skinned and fair-complexioned, welcomed these people and took them under their wing and taught them how to live by the golden rule, gave them everything. And after they gained their trust, they began actually to uh, share themselves with them. And they would have arranged marriages so that there were, were, uh, was a hybrid race that was developed uh, between this white race and the Native Americans 
that uh, were very tall, had the Cro-Magnon body with the strong jaw and the big orbits and the long bones, looked just like the Adena people. <laughs> and that uh, these people were, were bred for a well-planned exit by the Alejana. Now, what Lucy Thompson says is they lived together for thousands of years and lived in sweet harmony, and it was like heaven on earth. And this is the way it was back in the very ancient days. But there came a time when the Wagas, or, you know, the Alihana, who had members that may have been eight, nine, ten feet in height and robust, um, and who believed that the great spirit dwelt in the north, had to leave. Thompson relates to us that within one season, after they had lived with and grew interdependent and, and utterly were involved in deep friendship with these people, they left. They left. They walked away and they went to the north. And some stories say they also went to the east over through, um, through Europe and nobody knows what happened to them after that. But the people that went to the north, um, and you'll notice that uh, the last settlements of Cro-Magnon were in the north throughout the Arctic Circle in Russia. Uh -huh. And for some reason, Cro-Magnon, although they were all over the earth at one time, they all migrated toward the north. And in the end, they were called back by their chief priest, according to Thompson. And the chief priest um, was completely enlightened, was like a Christ-like being and had developed this Cro-Magnon race to be the harbingers of the Holy Spirit. And they had perfected themselves in body, mind, and in soul, so that when they had achieved this perfection, according to Thompson, they went back to this island or this place at the North Pole somewhere, and this corresponds to the legends of Hyperborea, which is a great temple that was somewhere in the north, probably within the Arctic Circle. And within this temple, there was, according to Thompson, a ladder, probably has a resonance in Jacob's ladder, I don't know. But yeah. those who came on this ladder, climbed this ladder, and they went into this paradise called Wersenda. Worsenau, and in this place, it was the true astral world, and it was the you know the the pure, the purest of the physical, and and uh, with an attribution of a great deal of the etheric uh, energy to it, which, um, according to legends, they dropped off their their the vestiges of their physical forms that took their astral astral forms. And just uh -huh. left. And the caves all around, the ice caves all around were filled with the bodies of the Cro-Magnon. And according to these legends, um, after the Cro-Magnon had all ascended, uh, and you can see a replica of the pyramid and the ladder, if you watch an old movie that was put together by a bunch of masons from Italy called Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. I know you might laugh at this. Oh, he wants us to watch this old fairy tale movie? Well, you don't have to watch it if you don't want to, but it'll give you a good idea of what um, Hyperborea may have looked like. So in any event, um, Thompson says that after the Wagas left, they, the world uh, changed, and the Native Americans um, began to separate into um, into various tribes. And that's really as far as she's able to infer with her words. At least that's what I gleaned from it. But we have been doing a lot of research on the tall people that were living among the Native Americans, and we were able to show how they all seem to have descended from this 
Cro-Magnon-like tribe or nation called the Allegheny. Not the Alahana, but the Allegheny or Allegui. Mm-hmm. And according to Delaware legend, about probably three to 3,500 years ago, 3,000 to 3,500 years ago, which is a long time after these Alihana left the country in charge of, uh, of the, who became the Allegheny, um, who were, according to her, they were one quarter Alihana and three quarters Native American. Some of them were half and half. But they were very tall and they were uh, light skinned, and a lot of Native people, I learned from Vine Deloria Jr., had light skin, especially uh, in the region between uh, uh, the Great Lakes and uh, the, the, the Rockies. Uh, many of those tribal traditions, and to this day, have very tall members with light skin. And uh, some of them even have uh, lighter colored hair. And these people still live to this day. On the Ozark Plateau, uh, there are tribal traditions that have been known about since the earliest period of American history when we tried to tax them. And uh, these people, we call them the Osage, still boast members in the families that are guys that stand six foot ten, seven feet, and... um, they, they even sent out, uh, in, during Washington's time, the painter George Catlin, and he captured on canvas at least two of these men who were members of the Sioux Nation or the you know, abstract of the Sioux, uh, who stood seven feet in height without any difficulty. <laughs> and they were robust, you know, and they, they didn't suffer from acromegaly. So this is just a part of a tradition that we believe was passed down from a race that was here before the Indians. Uh, you want to say something, Barbara, where I catch my breath? Because <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, the next part's going to knock your socks off. Oh, wait, I got to go put them on. Um, <laughs> I, I, no, I think this is what you're doing is giving everybody an understanding that that um, the tall people really – existed and they existed um, so profusely and they were created that way and it, it just I think so many people now are of the impression that ah, they were just anomalies but no they weren't it was a race that 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 was here to help teach and and they probably still do I think the fact that that we are discovering um, such an amazing, massive number of, of bodies from from all of the different. I think what, what gets me is that, that we have found these these bones that, that come from every time period. They're there, and and it's not like it's just one or two in many places. It's it's a tremendous number of them. So the, the, it, it, they were not just a single anom- anomaly within a, a group of people. The, there were many of them, and they had a purpose, and they had a, um, you, you know, if, if everything is larger, you kind of also have to understand that probably the spirit is larger and the, and the brain is larger. So there's, there's a, ba- a better capability of finding wisdom and truth within within everything around them. So it's not a surprise that in many cases it was it was thought that they were leaders and shaman and, and people who helped to lead and to uh, guide people along their pathways. Yeah, yeah. They, they were at one time. Uh, now, the average archaeologist isn't taught this in college or anthropologist. And immediately they try to debunk it, debunk it, debunk it. The reason we're so certain that the the prehistory of the United States and the world, for that matter, is um, is being given to us incrementally, is because it resonates so deeply for people that that are a little bit more advanced, like you are, Barbara, in knowledge of the soul, because we have. Um, 
sort of the ability to determine logically and rationally if something like this could have been. And if it could have been, then it probably was. So the next part of the story explains where these very tall and robust people got their stature from. And basically, uh, it's the same thing archaeologists uh, will teach us today and anthropologists. When a people settle down and they have a good food supply, a nutritional, nutritionally rich, they naturally grow taller. And we've, we've proven this even in modern times. The average height of a man in England three or 400 years ago was something like five foot six. And uh, that's because in the ancient times, we were always warring and the big men were always sent out to the front lines first. So, you know, the, the big, the, the genetics for larger stature was really uh, kind of put on the back burner because the big guys were always being killed off. But in, in the very ancient times, uh, at the end of a, a period of enlightenment, uh, you'll have uh, the remnants of, uh, of, of people who lived uh, uh, with a good food supply. And let me just explain to you what a good food supply means to the spiritually awakened. It consists of food that's been grown where... A, a station of process, a processing station has been created that does an exchange of the earth energies, the magnetic energies that the earth is constantly generating inside her, with the energies of the sky, which are also formed by the magnetic field, but passing through air. So in the old days, in the United States, well, what is now the United States and Canada, the, uh, the Alihana used the mountaintops and many um, beautiful architectures to, or for the express purpose of keeping a balance between heaven and earth, between earth and sky. And interestingly, it, it, you know, the same thing happened Externally in those days is what happens internally when we sit down and pray and contemplate uh, the nature of love. The body begins to produce light and, and, uh, and we become more receptive. Well, the earth, when it conferiates or it marries the negative energies of the sky with the positive energies of the earth, produces this stuff that is known from ancient times as, as um, mana, or in India they call it prana. And the stuff has its own light, and it gets into plants. Plants actually absorb it very quickly. They're greedy for it. Um, it nature doesn't produce it now because they did it artificially because they were in cooperation with the earth. And what, what is necessary to produce this mana, prana being its, its equivalent within the body, um, is to um, make sure that, that uh, you're able to um, create this interface. And for that, uh, something called the Manitou system was set up by the Alihana in this country that was once here, called Manitoba, or Great Manitoba, or Gitche Manitoba. And uh, the Serpent Mound, I believe, was their chief Manitou, and was actually a symbolic of the worm of the phoenix that rises once every 7,000 years, which we are about to start on. So in order to acquire this larger stature, um, they had to produce this stuff in great abundance, constantly, because it only occurs in nature when lightning strikes 
and it strikes where the earth has produced a spark to attract it. We've only known this for about 30 years. Science has only recently known about the stepladder phenomenon where a spark is sent up from a bush or a tree or a mountaintop, some high place, and that attracts a great download, a thunderbolt, from the sky, from the clouds. So that happens, and the, and, and the rain comes, and when the lightning goes through the atmosphere, it breaks up all the nitrogen into, into individual monatomic nitrogen that easily dissolves in the rainwater, and that gets into the plants along with this energy, and so plants grow up to seven times faster than they would with just normal watering when there's a thunderstorm. So the, the ancients knew this trick of nature, and so they decided to create this stuff all the time. And to do it, they had to create pyramids with capstones with little crystals on them or temples that had spires on them, like church steeples. Or they created manitous, like the serpent, which would have a little, a little um, uh, sort of altar at its head, like, a, like the pyramid on the back of a $1 bill. And at the top of the altar would be a little crystal or a, a golden. And, and that would attract the energy from the sky so well that it would preempt lightning strikes. There'd be so much energy being pulled out of clouds that they would just send the energy down in a stream of luminous rain or mist constantly. And this energy would be consummated by energy from the earth that the serpent was always filling up with because it was there on a, on a, uh, on a big piece of limestone. And it would absorb all the loose energy from the meteor crater that it's in and so this, this wonderful interplay between heaven and earth produced so much light. It's not the kind of light you can see with your eyes, unless you're really sensitive. You can sit still a long time and you can see it. But it's, it's the kind of light that brings life. And so everything grows more quickly and bigger and it, every cell of every fruit that grows and everything, every leaf, is loaded with spiritual light. And so many species used to exist when the conditions were allowing for their delicate nature to come out. And, uh, you know, all plants and all animals, as far as we know, have what we call junk DNA, because we don't know what the DNA was for. But mm -hmm. if we're eating properly, if we're eating plants, and of course, most of these people were nonviolent, so they didn't kill animals. Um, so the animals partook it, but they were allowed milk from the animals, which is the essence of their flesh and tissues without killing the animal. And uh, Lucy Thompson says that they used to uh, herd uh, the deer and, and milk them, and they would drink the milk, and it, it, it just gave them longevity and, you know, a greater, and they would eat the fruits from their trees. And so these people grew to be very tall and, uh, and very strong, and their intellectual capacity went beyond the normal ability to comprehend the universe, and they began to perfect the soul itself after their bodies were enriched by the light. And so it's, it's a sort of reversal, but when they reached that tipping point where their minds were loaded with light, they just loved everybody. They didn't make war anymore, these Alihana. They made love. And, and not necessarily the sexual kind. They were very chaste people because they were satisfied. They didn't lust after their neighbor's wives, these men. And their marriages were prearranged and everything was done slowly with grace. 
And so the, the early Native people knew how to go about living in a paradisiacal situation because there was absolute cooperation with nature. So you can imagine how if the system was suddenly interrupted and the people were utterly dependent upon the mana feeding the plants, feeding the animals, uh, and feeding people, that in just one night when these people left, the people began to forget how to maintain these sacred places. Now, Lucy Thompson says that all over the mountains, on the mountaintops, from coast to coast, and in special special places that they were set aside, the Wagas, a.k.a. the Alihana, uh, taught them how to keep this harmony going on the earth. But when these people left, they maintained them for a while, but after a while they forgot how to do it. And so it didn't take long before the people were no longer unified as one people. They no longer practiced the golden rule. You see, because that takes a, a very loving person, a loving group of people to continually practice. And anybody that's not familiar with the golden rule, it's this. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do for others as you would do for yourself. And this sort of selfless system permeated the Americas and at one time the entire world and returns to us once every 7,000 years for the specific purpose of coming back for those who are ready to take back into the astral world, the happy hunting ground, the Tir Nanog, the uh, Jay Gardens, uh, the Elysian Fields. These places still exist. Atlantis has an, a, a huge archipelago with over 150 islands that are invisible to our eyes because they're covered over by the etheric veil, so to speak. They sort of are of a higher frequency of purity. And many people live on those islands and uh, they enjoy an existence that in, in, entitles them to a lifespan that could exceed 10,000 years, 100,000 years or more if they really get into the divine arts. And that's, that's what happens here. Once every... 7,000 years, the Alihana return. They return in the form of people, of mortals. And when a lot of them come back, the secret of how to restore the earth is given out, and everybody begins to practice it. And it's addictive. It, it's something that um, is irresistible. And for some reason... When these systems collapse overnight, um, we also forget how it was. So when anthropologists and archaeologists laugh at you, it's the laughter of a dilettante that you're hearing. <laughs> it's not the laughter of someone who has the knowledge of spirituality. It's the laughter of someone who only knows what he can see and, and touch and, and uh, smell. But with the full knowledge of, of, of the, the soul and the, the mind, the robust uh, and, and truly spiritual nature people, um, we can restore the earth in less than 100 years. Less than 100 years. And what we're going to be doing, and this process began already, is restoring the, the picture of the great seal of the United States. Um, you've heard of the number 1776, and was that a year that was deliberately sort of built in to the karma of the founding fathers, perhaps without their knowledge, perhaps with their knowledge, 
uh, that um, inspires us to understand it as a number that stands the test of time because it's twice 888, a number that was used by the Greeks. And I hope I'm not losing anybody because I'll come back to where we oh, started. Oh, no, I'm sure not. Don't worry about it. Okay. A number that uh, they spelled the fifth with and Jesus with, and this is in the original form, Iota, Eta, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma. It's worth 888. And this kind of numerology is embedded in the founding father's philosophy so that by redoubling this power of the Lord, you get the glory of God descending upon the, um, the ancient country of Manitoba so that Manitoba begins to phase into the gross physical, which is loaded with corruption now. now I don't have to name any names <laughs> as no, no. far as politics are concerned to, to understand that you need to absolutely corrupt the old world it's an alchemical law uh, before the new can be reborn out of it. Mm-hmm. And we believe, we know that the serpent mound is the worm of the ancient phoenix. And that by understanding all the knowledge contained in the serpent, all knowledge of the moon, all knowledge of the sun, all knowledge of the stars, all knowledge of heaven the magnetism combining with the earthly magnetism, all knowledge of the uh, architecture, the geometric uh, axioms of pi and phi, the Pythagorean theorem, the um, the Vesic Pisces, and so forth, all of these are embedded with the serpent as a template explaining them all perfectly. And so as we progress in understanding that the ancients embedded all knowledge we see also that the tree of life, as it appears as the Kabbalistic tree, um, is born out of the magic square of eight, and the serpent also fits into that. And the point I'm trying to make is that the serpent is the seed of light, and it comprised the nature of the Ophidian mysteries, which were the basis for much of the Pythagorean college. And um, and other college, like the College of Orpheus. And these spread out through Chaldea, Egypt, Persia, and so forth, taking the form of various schools until the Gnostics attempted to reform everything. And then the appearance of the Christ around 2,000 years ago um, sort of reinstated the Neo-Pythagorean overview through the Essenes uh, handiwork of pr- preservation and so forth. But all this information gets back to the serpent and also built into the serpent as a date of 3000 BC, give or take a few hundred years. And that's because at the end of the last Phoenix rising, which was between 7,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago, there's a thousand years of light and Manitoba thrived. And people came from all over the world to visit this land of marvels and magic. And they would uh, take home with them cloths and precious waters and nectars and special metals and things like that to remind them of what is possible. And um, Egypt and other areas of Mesopotamia were colonies of New Atlantis back when. Then between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago, the Phoenix, which is the head of which was the state of Michigan, its wings were rose into the Dakotas and, and all through New England, up into Canada, its body, just like the great seal of the United States. And it folded its wings and became a tiny little serpent. And they created an ever-burning lamp. And the Cherokee have a story about, about the jewel called Ulanya Sut that was taken from the head of the Oktina, the Manitou. And that jewel at one time was as brilliant as the noonday sun because it was still being fed by energies from the earth and sky. 
but it was considered to be of great value. So one of their brave men eventually snatched it. And that's when the lights went out in the United States. That's when the last of the great lamps was extinguished and Manitoba fell into darkness and the people got lost and they went blind and they separated into different tribal traditions. And and this this was all just between 6,000 and 5,000 years ago. So all of the great medicine men met in Ohio at the site of the last serpent, which was like a great frog or something. And they took all the knowledge that they had from the, the existence of Manitoba in the previous thousand years, and they created this Manitou that we today only have the dirt floor of that we call Serpent Mound. And at the head of it, they created the ever-burning lamp, just like in Arlington Cemetery, some presidents had the ever-burning lamp, you know. But this was done through the magical tradition of the Native people before they forgot how to do it. At the same time, in the East, the capstone was being removed from the pyramid and, and so forth. And so when men fall into darkness, they can't remember how to do things that They just remembered that their ancestors were great, that they were gods. And indeed, they were. Christ said to us, ye are gods. Okay, I got to take a break. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Take it, Barbara. He he did say, uh, this and all things will you do and more. And I think that's one of the things that, that all of us are are being stirred to remember. I, I think our, our DNA carries memory of, of countless past lives and past times. And it seems to me that we're at a time frame where people are beginning to, to have those memories stirred and, and given to them in dream state or in inspiration or however. And, and people are beginning to realize that there is a power inside of them that they they just need to reach and embrace and make it part of their life and and then they can they can really create their reality by their perception of it they can add a greater vitality and vibrance to their life by merging with that light that is within uh so many people for so long have been taught that that they are in a cage instead of that the, they're not in a cage, that they have the freedom inside of them to do anything and go anywhere if they, if they so choose to. But it, but it takes work to get there. It's not something, nobody, nobody waves a magic wand. Everyone has to have their own journey. But the reality is the map is within. We carry that map inside of us. And, um, yeah, I would say that I've, I've often said to people that, you know, you think you're in, in a time of enlightenment, and I said, we're in the dark ages. We're, I, I do believe we're coming out of the dark ages, but we've been in the dark ages as far as spirituality goes for a very long time. And spirit is just beginning to, let, you know, that that flame, that spark has always been within us, but, but it's being fanned into a greater flame these days. And more and more people are beginning to, to be able to see that it's casting a light on, on a journey that is profound and magical. Yes, these are the blessed children that are being born now. Um, mm-hmm. By following the golden rule, we can accomplish much. It, it just takes practice. And if you're not good at it, then just... Um, start a new habit, like brushing your teeth every night, you know. Um, Be gentle to everyone. Um, Be kind. Uh, Be generous as far as you're able to. Um, Don't let your mind tell you what to do. You make a conscious decision. Let let the control of your life come from your soul and and not your mind, because the mind gets into mischief. (laughs) Lucy Thompson um, was a, must have been a, a lovely woman um, because part of her story goes back even further in time. 
And she said that before the Wagas, the Alihana, were here, there was a race of truly gigantic people. And they had black, the men had black beards, and their flesh was kind of tawny. And um, they were very cruel to the indigenous people and kept them sort of enslaved. So when we first started researching Native American tallness, one of, the, one of the most interesting accounts came right out of New England, your neck of the woods there, Barbara. And it, it said that um, in the beginning, um, w- when my grandfather was a boy, he lived among the Indians for a time. And he said that there was once a race here that had black beards, and uh, they were very large in size. And then, as the story goes, then a race of red-bearded men came and drove out all the black beards. Now, we didn't know what that meant. It was just an anomalous bit until I read Thompson's book, and she said the same thing, that before... The the, uh, the this race of fair-skinned people um, took over the the continent. There was another race here of of people who had been there for a very long time, and they were really t- gigantic in size. I, I imagine these these people stood twelve feet or fifteen feet, and, and Thompson said that every once in a while. They will find their implements, and they can't move them because they're so big, these big stone implements. And uh, she said that most of the stuff that they had uh, is lost now because it fell deep into the earth. But the fact is that this race of black beards also um, may have had knowledge on superintending the earth and cooperating with the earth and being able to bring in enough of the etheric energy to keep themselves wealthy and and in charge so they could dominate the smaller people, make them their slaves. And I guess they prayed for a for a savior, the, the indigenous people did. And to give you some idea, we're going back maybe thirty thousand years Oh, good. More. Okay, yeah. Yeah, They're a long time ago. And uh, then uh, apparently the great spirit, the great mystery sent the, the Cro-Magnon, and they took over this country and inherited the system that the black-bearded, cruel giants were using, and they turned it to the good. And they began to... to um, heal the people and um, they invited more uh, native people to come in into the land with time so that by the time Lucy Thompson's people came probably 14 15,000 years maybe before that uh, when the glaciers were just starting to melt and receding um, they they had been here um, tens of thousands of years so the way Thompson words it, it it makes it sound like there there was a long period of peace and prosperity here and that we just lost the memory of it but interestingly she says that their legends aver that before they left these alihana these who she calls the wagas promised that they would return one day. And she says that the people waited for thousands of years patiently for the Wagas to return so that when the white Europeans came, they thought that was the Wagas returning. And they rejoiced and treated them with, and they very quickly found out that these were not their friends. Yeah. And, and they were cruelly tricked, and it was difficult for them to have to um, discern that 
it wasn't the skin color. It was, you know, the love that these people had for them that made them miss them so much and made them regret when the European savages came and destroyed uh, this country, lock, stock, and barrel, and are still doing it. They're still destroying it. So I thought that was interesting. It, 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 you know, this this story probably permeated even down into Central Mesoamerica and South America because when the people came, um, when the Spaniards came, they thought that they were the white people, you know. They compared uh-huh. them to Viracocha, who was also supposed to have been a white guy, but probably Viracocha was, that's another story, was here just 2,000 years ago, and he was a great artist. But that's that's another program I'll have to discuss, <laughs> the, the Nazca yeah. figures and how they were probably made by Viracocha, and they all go into a puzzle, uh, a celestial puzzle. They were scattered all over the desert up in there in the Andes in the high altitude, waiting to be put together one day so we could have a great message about the present day and, and what's happening right now. By the way, I think your your people, Barbara, that you've managed to accumulate over many years of successful broadcasting uh, would like to know that it is commonly known among the holy uh, populace of India that the entire holy scene that used to be centered for at least five or six thousand years in India and the Himalayas into Persia and China, that whole area that was once the seat and still is of spiritual power on the earth is shifting so the entire spiritual axis of the world is shifting over to North America, uh-huh. to the Americas. Now, I've heard this uh, a couple of times, and one of the sources was quite reliable. And I know from my own meditations that indeed there is a great spiritual revolution. And in fact, many holy men, starting with um, back in the in the 20s and the 30s, um, you have um, guys coming over like Yogananda uh, who began to very gently inculcate the teachings of the East and the universal understanding of, of meditation and loving each other and, and how by practicing this sort of uh, knowledge of self-awareness and knowledge of knowing what we really are, in spite of getting the derisive laughter of the more worldly people, um, is coming to the foreground very strongly. And that instead of incarnating in the East, which is where all of the hungry seekers and all the masters have been incarnating for thousands of years, they're incarnating into Native American bodies here in the United States and Central America and South America. And that the Andes and the Rockies will become the new Himalayas. And the Laurentians and the Smokies, as well as the Ozarks, will all be populated by um, long-term residents that have true spiritual knowledge. And during this period of transition, which is upon us right now, um, Mm -hmm. we will see more successful marriages than we ever dreamed could possibly happen. And it's through successful marriages where people actually don't bicker and gnaw at each other, actually practice the golden rule, serve each other, love each other, touch each other's feet. How can I serve you, my dear wife? I love you so much. And she doing the same. My husband, how can I serve you better? And speak to each other like children in a very childlike way, 
practice that in your own privacy at home, and it'll spill over into the workplace. You might be embarrassed a little, but eventually this kind of magic will transform. It's like Gandhian magic. It's like the kind of magic that Gandhi introduced when the horses were all coming. He said, everybody lay down, and they did. And the horses stopped in their tracks because they were oh, not yeah. walking people. And the kind of magic that happens when peaceful nonviolence challenges the off there are off you know <clears throat> the British. <laughs> and they're well, off there he, are, you know, Gandhi was was amazing. He absolutely personified living his belief. And um I have a favorite story of him. He was at his compound and a woman uh, walked five miles barefoot dirt road with her son to speak with him and she said to the, she said to him, he's eating chocolate, it's going to rot his teeth, tell him to stop and Gandhi said, Come back in five days and she said, Tell him now and Gandhi said, I can't tell him now, come back in five days And so they walked their five miles back and Five days later, they walked the five miles again barefoot back to the compound. And and she stood before him and she said, well, and he looked at the boy and he said, stop eating chocolate, it's going to rot your teeth. And she said, you couldn't say that five days ago? And he said, five days ago, I wasn't eating chocolate. <laughs> so that, you know, he, he was a personification of, of living what, his own inner truth was, Practice and he would preach. never, yeah, and, and it, 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 it's, it's amazing, and, and that's a true story. Yeah, there's a saint in the make, but, yeah. you know, these, these, these guys, there's a lot of people like this incarnating in the West now. You're uh-huh. not going to hear about them, you know, because they're people of humility, but the way the theater is set up, um, the United States is going to completely deteriorate politically. Every system is going to break down before this is over. And, and during this time, all of the people who have incarnated to do this mission of restoring the light through the Phoenix Rising will be empowered beyond their wildest dreams with so much love and so much compassion and so much wealth, inner wealth, and also external wealth that they'll have access to, that they'll be able to work together to rebuild this country in the true spirit of 1776. This isn't just uh, idle talk. It isn't a prophecy. It's something that is logically going to happen if we understand what has happened in the past. So, well, there is that saying of you know people who don't understand history are are forced to repeat it, and I think we're on the brink of that. So that yeah, so that it, you know, if we do understand history, we may be forced to repeat a very very pleasant version of the United States that happened 7,000 years ago. And like clockwork is happening again, we will see a general rise in appreciation for the Serpent Mound and related sacred sites. That's number one. We will see centers established that will the islands of safety for people who need to get away first on the weekends, but eventually restyle themselves so that they can live honestly uh, in the country. And more and more um, we'll see um, these places flourishing and these spiritual islands um, just appear to be like, what the Amish have accomplished over mm-hmm. several centuries. And, but 
but um, um, they, they actually will take the form of actual <laughs> astral islands. And there, there are many of them all over the world. Um, the Serpent Mound is on one. That I drew a grid beneath one, the Flower of Life grid, which the serpent just happens to fit precisely on <laughs> um, within perfect inches of absolute perfection because it was designed to be the centerpiece of a spiritual island. And, and as we move toward this enlightened period, these islands put out more and more energy, and it's up to us to tap this energy and combine it with the energies of the sky and begin to transform the United States so that and Canada so that it will become a model country for uh, other countries to follow. And I, I tell they, you truly. Have, have, they been able to, yeah, have they been able to to date the Serpent Mound, to, to, to determine just who were the creators of it, how long ago it was created? Well, archaeologists only work by physical evidence. So they found yeah. some carbon recently um, that was dated to about 325 B.C., about 2,300, 2,400 years ago, Okay. But 2,400 years before that, 5,000 years ago, there's a star date clearly established and printed in the design of the serpent as it was 5,000 years ago with a pole star at the geographic center beneath the seventh coil from the tail. That's the geographic center of the serpent. And in my book, Star Mounds, there's a, a really good um, really good map of it, so you can understand it's explained very cogently. So if we're to understand when it was designed, we'll go from the star date. But because after the serpent was had its jewel taken, according to Cherokee legend, the people came to this and, and uh, several dozen other sacred sites around surrounding the serpent in what I call a cosmography. And they began to take away the relics. Just like in the old days, when, whenever a saint died, they would uh, inter the body. And uh, sometimes if the saint didn't decay, he would put it on display. And there's one story about St. Xavier um, who founded um, the uh, Jesuit Society. He was a founder of it. How his body was immutable when he died. And they put it on display in a crystal casket. Well, mm -hmm. these guys, these monks from all over the Mediterranean and Africa, he was in Africa, um, used to come and they would worship this relic of a body, but they bite off the toe or take a, a piece of the finger or rip off some of the hair and take it back to their monastery and they create a new altar with a holy relic, see? So the people did the same thing here. After the Manitou was disabled and no longer produced the spiritual light and the mana, the life, uh, they began to um, take all of the pieces of wood and the, um, you know, the, the, the knacker, which is, you know, the, um, the seashell, you know, the mussel shell, mother of pearl that it was covered in, the little pieces of quartz crystal, and everything that was precious that used to kind of um, exalt the energy that was coming from the serpent as it processed the energies of earth and sky was taken by the people until all that was left was a little bit of dirt. They even took the stones that were shoring it up. And so that took about 2,500 years after they built the Manitou 5,000 years ago to commemorate the, the death of the phoenix, right? You get uh -huh. all of this? So 
2,500 years passed, and all that's left of all these ancient sacred temples and the central Manitou temple are just these dirt, pieces of dirt that were roughly in the shape. And then this great battle took place between the Delaware and the Allegheny people. And after the um, battle was over, the women folk from the Allegheny were spared. And that's why this hybrid race we call the Adena has so many large members at first because of this inbreeding with a few almost extinct members of the of the Lenny Lenape with the uh, prisoners of war. And it's a very interesting scenario. You have to read A Tradition of Giants to get the whole picture archaeologically. It's really good. Oh, it's paper. amazing. And, and so what happened was these, this new breed, these Adena people, um, who were educated by the mothers who were of the Allegheny, kind of reconstituted the Allegheny race in the Adena. So that's why the Adena looks so much different from the Hopewell who lived in the Archaic period as well as the Hopewell who lived uh, in the post-Adena period. They were the indigenous people that had probably been there for 20,000 years as far as we know. And so um, <laughs> this, these Adena people um, um, began to recreate these sites. They made it their mandate. It was given to them by the traditions that was given to them by the, by the grandmothers who were always, you know, in their system, the mothers and the grandmothers are the bosses. And what they uh-huh. tell the men to do, the men have to do. They have the <laughs> right of life or death over men. Yeah. And the grandmothers yeah. counsel rules Native American people, especially among the Iroquois. To this day, it does. But in those days, we know that the women, from their knowledge of traditions passed down, said, you must save these sites. So a great sort of reclamation project was started, similar to the one that we're doing today in the Ohio Valley, kind of rebuilding some of these destroyed places with the help of the Friends of Serpent Mound and the Ark of Appalachia and, and uh, the, um, the Ohio, uh, it used to be the Ohio Historical Society and, and other groups are all really kind of turned on by this idea of preserving these ancient sites. Well, little do we know that the Adena and Hopewell people didn't design these magnificent structures. The, the mathematics alone is mind-boggling which I also yeah. demonstrate in Star Mounds and the mystery of the Serpent Mound. And, and so we know that the Adena people trained the Hopewell people to complete this work. And that's why we had all these beautiful earthworks already there when Squire and Davis, who were two pretty talented map makers, came in the early part of the 19th century. To, uh, to, you know, sketch out uh, these places. They did a pretty darn good job. I mean, they made some mistakes, but we were able to get a pretty good idea of, of what these places look like, thanks to the Adena and the Hopewell people who were following the dictates of the grandmothers. Now, here's where archaeologists say, where is he getting his information? You dummy, all you have to do is meditate and let it all sift in and read what Native people have to say. Don't use your authority to give people a bum steer. Allow the Native voice to come through. Allow it. Love these people. Listen to what I'm saying, because I'm not stupid. And I know <laughs> that these things came to pass. The Adena rebuilt the Serpent Mound. And it lasted another 2,500 years in just a dirt and stone form. But it was enough to empower the Adena and Hopewell with a whole new understanding of the Thunderbird and the Serpent. 
And so a revolution occurred. The Adena went to places to the east, to the west, and to the south. They carried their stature with them. And then after the Hopewell people left the Ohio Valley around 500 A.D. or C.E., we like to say sometimes, they went um, to the west mostly, and they began to find all these old sites all over the place, especially along the great rivers. And one by one, they began to rehab them. One by one, they created all these beautiful pyramids, uh, truncated mostly, and all these circles and squares and odd shapes, figure eights, these beautiful things. And they went about it for nearly a 1,000 years. And this started probably right in the Ohio Valley with the Adena rehabbing the sites that were here that had been worn down from people taking, you know, uh, the artifacts from these holy places and probably eating them in small bits for their food to get that holiness oh. back in them. So, oh, you know, and then, and then it, it completed its, its and, and then it came back up the Mississippi and went back into the Ohio Valley and they rehabbed the Serpent Mound and other places a little bit again. So that's why we find what we call Fort Ancient Carbon at Serpent Mound and at the Granville Effigy, also called the Alligator Mound, uh, because um, the so-called Fort Ancient people, who were probably a branch of the Mississippian culture, who were related to the Hopewell, the ancient Hopewell, um, um, came back through here. And so it was like a fever these people had to reclaim. And if you look at these architectures, a really good book is by Morgan, Prehistoric Architectures of the Eastern United States, which you can get on Amazon. And you can see how many of these things reflect a knowledge of geometrics and architecture that is sublime. And uh, we also are piecing together the fact that they had a secret society and that this secret society was able to maintain the knowledge of their rehabbing these shapes and their memories being sort of brought back a little bit. They understood some of these architectures in a way that enabled them to kind of invoke the energies of the Thunderbird again, you know, the sky and earth. In fact, the Adena people created these conical mounds with moats in them, which is explained by uh, a Native American medicine man named Rolling Thunder. He said that in the old days, um, the people would um, observe where the lightning struck, and they would place a place, a, 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 a sort of concave area where water could catch, and if the lightning struck in a certain place, if you drank the water within, I think, 10 to 15 seconds or as soon as you could, it would be healing. And uh, so the Adena artificially attracted lightning. They would create these conical mounds. They would make them sanctuaries by putting, you know, a, a dead chief or a medicine man in there. But they often wouldn't be havens for many bodies because uh, they were made to attract lightning, and around the base of them, they created moats, and they kept the moats filled with water. And oftentimes, like in Cincinnati, they created linear mound works, because we now know that uh, earth energy, electrical earth energy, tends to um, drift to sort of uh, migrate to higher ground, and so, just like in England with standing stones um, placed in straight lines, uh, gravity anomalies uh, attract light and uh, energies from the earth. Uh, so the Native Americans created these conduits of mound structures, uh, and Cincinnati was a good example, uh, that would carry the energy toward a central mound, like an electric power plant, and uh, but all done organically with the highest respect for nature, 
and they would literally invoke the Thunderbird, and the lightning would come, and uh, like I think in the Chicago area, um, there are sites where uh, archaeologists have placed poles. Um, like uh, there was a site near Cahokia, or in Cahokia, where they put a pole, and it attracted so much lightning, it kind of destroyed the pole after a while, because <laughs> they had this knowledge of building an artificial mountain in a plain, kind of like a Glastonbury or Serpent Mountain is a similar kind of thing, and being the high ground and using every convenience at their disposal, they would attract the earth energies to one place, and this would invoke the energies of the sky. And, uh, you know, a good medicine man with a good believing imagination can use that plastic energy to create images for the people to see. And I have no doubt that they were able to invoke thunderbirds, animals that, I mean, I've seen clouds turn into lions and other creatures that looks so real, you can almost hear the roar. Uh Just by believing um, the energies of clouds are very plastic. And the old medicine men and the old sages uh, knew these these little um, sort of tricks. Um, And I think, um, and I'm not the only one that believes this, but I, I believe the hope while we're energized, by their service at rehabbing that they kind of reconvene the knowledge of heaven and earth to some extent. And they went about practicing it. And the chieftainships had a great deal of power uh, in those times that lasted for centuries as they rehabbed the site. So they were empowered and sort of paid back by the great spirit. Uh, For those of you that don't believe this, what, what was that, Barbara? So I, I, my question is now: the serpent mound has it's a very you know it, it the mouth of the serpent has an an egg or or something like an egg in its mouth, and then there is a pyramid. Is that where that stone was? That crystal stone that was supposed that was stolen? Yeah, I, I think that you know the uh, if you look in the back of a one dollar bill, you get this sort of pyramid. I think there was a three sided pyramid there. It was yeah. approximately. 31, 32 feet um, high, and it probably had a small capstone. And uh, the base of the pyramid was 31.6 feet, measured by archaeologist William F. Romain, Dr. William F. Romain, back in 1987. And so I theorized that that was a little tower and that the, uh, the oval that the serpent has in its mouth <clears throat> was actually a, it was actually a platform that held a, a beautiful sun disk and that the sun disk could have been made of copper burnished and polished or at least copper coated made of wood and copper coated it's a large thing or uh-huh. if we want to get ridiculously sublime it could be stored somewhere in the catacombs beneath serpent mound there are rumored to be monstrous caves down there because when the lightning strikes near Serpent Mound, sometimes you hear the thunder underground, not above ground. So we think the native people sealed off the entrances and stored many of the artifacts that produced the mechanistics of paradise. Those things that were necessary to invoke upon the land the Holy Spirit of the marriage between heaven and earth. And it's an actual science they bore, and I believe the serpent was a scientific instrument that, used properly, um, produced so much balanced energy that it literally gave life to, (laughs) dare I say it, to creatures that Native Americans don't like to talk about because they're reluctant to draw the fire of skeptics. <laughs> real, real dragons that transferred. 
the the energies of the sacred sites to outlying um, tribal places so people can drink the charged water and and eat the charged food of these stations of of heavenly reckoning <laughs> and you know these places were so well conceived and so beautifully designed and built that it it's a shame that they have to be taken away from us, but they do. We're about to embark on a 1,000-year period where these sacred sites will be reactivated and the mana will be reproduced. And there are seven great cities that will reappear before us. They're in existence now. One is where Tallahassee is. Right now, uh-huh. and that's what we call the base chakra. The sexual chakra is where Atlanta, Georgia is. That's a very powerful, energized uh, source of life, because the the sexual energy is fed by by a tremendous amount of life force that goes up the Shushu Manituba. Um, in the occult physiology, it's called the Shushuma in India. But here uh-huh. it ran from the Gulf of Mexico up to the top of Michigan. It was called the Shushu Manitou. Shushu Manituba drew the water from the Gulf and converted it into pure energy and sent it through seven mighty chakras that were in the form of these beautiful and still exist uh, garden cities that are really made of substances that are akin to precious stones. Okay, and, so after Atlanta, there is after Atlanta. The next one is the is the um, the digestive uh, chakra, and that's in Tennessee. That's a very sacred area. It's somewhere like between, um, oh gosh, somewhere between Oak Ridge and another city. Uh, uh-huh. But it's it's still forming. Better formed is the uh, heart chakra, which is um, uh, in the area of Lexington, uh, Kentucky. And then the next one is the uh, the throat chakra, which is in the area of Cincinnati and Dayton, Yellow Springs. And then the next one is the mighty eye of the Lord of the earth, and that is Lansing, Michigan. And if you look at the geology of Lansing, it's at the base of a huge bowl. (laughs) It's really interesting. But the crown chakra, the glory, uh, it was once fed by the copper that was once spiritualized to the point where it flowed with its brilliant light, which flowed like Ori calcose, which is the form of transmuted copper, which is a red metal, is imperishable, um, is Sault Ste. Marie. So these chakras are all fed with this energy from the Gulf. And then, you know, it, it's spent and then it's sent back. And it's, it's it just, this, this goes on for a thousand years. But it builds wow. to a zenith. And during that time, the state of Michigan becomes the great head, and the upper peninsula is the plume, the the living plume, and that's where all the copper used to be. Uh And all the mineral wealth, all the water is remagnetized and resituated so that it all extols the glory of the mighty phoenix, this is a world symbol, and um, its wings stretch all the way to the East Coast and up into Canada through New England, and there are so many feathers on it, and each feather is uh, another magical uh, world, another magical community where people live and have their sustenance in the Holy Spirit. And they, their lives transcend anything we can imagine. 
And then the other wing goes up into the Dakotas and up into Canada into Manitoba, uh, what we now call Manitoba. I believe that's, I'm not familiar with the states that well out there. And then there's this great gloriole around Michigan, and um, it it kind of touches at the base of uh, the Puget uh, and the, uh, the the Great Bay up there of Hudson. And uh-huh. this gloriole is rumored to hold <clears throat> the mysteries from the very earliest um, creations of the of the most ancient magicians that first settled the earth nearly a billion years ago. And there are said to be creatures that are unspeakably powerful and monstrous in size that stand for the four elements, actually five elements, that are kept there lest they get loose. So once every... <laughs> Once every 7,000 years, the glory of the phoenix reactivates that, those areas and feeds those elementals and keeps them calm and in a state of harmony. So it's really important that the phoenix rise. And, and there, there's all kinds of other lore that's going to come to us, but it does have the shafts of wheat in one of its talons and thunderbolts in the other. But these things change, and it holds other treasures over this period of time. In fact, it changes into the great goddess, and that lasts for a long time. And then it also changes into the great the great chief, the great chieftain, and uh, the, his, his bonnet has feathers in it that go all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And it shines. And every one of those feathers is from a previous phoenix's life. And he is spirit chief. And he wears uh, a luminous fabric that looks like a finely tanned, and beautifully made silken buckskin. It's hard. You can't really imagine because he's the radiant form of all men. And she is the radiant form of all women's heart's desire. And this kind of transcendental shape-shifting goes on. Meanwhile, in the tissues of the body of the great phoenix, which is set on a beautiful octagonal diadem in a sea of spiritual ether, um, the the people are in competition to create the most beautiful gardens you've ever had the pleasure of imagining. And these gardens in the last when the last phoenix rose. Now, mind you, these this the this internal phoenix is inaccessible to all but those who have surrendered themselves, body, mind and spirit to the great mystery. So what I'm describing to you is not possible to see unless you have given yourself to the Lord. Absolutely turn yourself over and worked out all of your karmas and have served humankind before yourself in every possible way. But when these gardens produce, like they have honeybees, for example, and they have apiaries, and the bees are supposed to be gigantic, but they're harmless, left un, unmolested. And they create a honey that is so perfect that it glows with a golden light. And this honey used to be taken very carefully with the permission of the bee, along with the royal jelly and other products that the bees make. And it was shipped over and given as gifts to people around the world. They also grew various substances that produce threads like cotton and flax. But these threads were also made from 
the cooperation between earth and sky, and they were also self-luminous. I think you might remember uh, the last uh, Hobbit movie, how one of the magicians, his name has slipped my mind, Rata, I forgot his name, um, he said that everything used to be self-luminous, but now only the mushrooms are. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was worried about it. And that's the way the world was. You see, the world was losing its luminous plants. And in the beginning of The Lord of the Rings, uh, it says, a shadow has come over the world. And it's a true story. And that happened no more prominently than right here where the United States is now in Canada. So they created these, these beautiful yarns and threads and they created fabrics and they created things that people could wear and they shipped out these raw materials and they had silkworms that were really much more nimble and and they themselves were luminous and they put their light and their life into their silk and they harvested the silk and they made beautiful uh, self luminous Every color of the rainbow, shifting colors of silk. And they gave it to the people all over the world so that the people wouldn't come. But they did grant visas to people to come here. So you would have dignitaries and representatives from, you know, places that we now call Egypt and Mesopotamia, Australia, um, places uh, south places to the west, places to the north, uh, all over the world would come and they would be given admittance <clears throat> to um, this blessed land that we call Yeti Manitoba or the land of the great spirit, home of the brave and the trustworthy, home of them who follow the golden rule. Mm-hmm. And so they would export everything, but they would never ask for anything in return. And in this way, they created no debt. And so when the time came that the phoenix had to collapse and recede back into the fifth dimension, the dimension where the earth was enriched ethereally, they could do so without anyone being able to stop them. And during that period, anyone that received the light of the Spirit and used it to ignite the lamp of their own souls and were able to maintain the light of their souls, they were able to go back to paradise whenever they wanted. And a society was started of record keepers and people who kept the knowledge of the medicine. And even in, until the modern times, these medicine men, both in India and in Native America, still have supernatural ability. They're able to go into internal worlds. They might not be as good as their grandfathers were because time has a way of affecting us. But Vine Deloria said that he had a friend named Bill Tall Bull who used to go to a place to leave an offering of tobacco that he said had turned to stone but was once a living garden. And he said there were also places underwater that people used to be able to walk to, but are now you can't go into them without drowning. Because when the etheric element left this world, everything dried up. Because that's the water of life. Alchemists talk about it. They know how to extract it from certain minerals because it's in abundance uh, in certain minerals. Like, I believe, um, orange oil, for example. You ever wonder why orange oil is such a great cleanser? And, and sulfuric acid, why it's such a great all-purpose acid? Or uh, banana oil? It's because it contains a lot more of the etheric element than other oils. They all contain it to some extent. Everything yeah. has some of it. But 
the alchemists knew, like for example, um, there was an alchemist who lived back, I guess in the 1500s. I've forgotten his name, but but he said that it exists in orpiment. But in any case, they were able to extract this element and make the philosopher's stone. Now, this is something I know nothing about, but but I just I'm throwing this out that you know initiated societies still have fragments of this knowledge that was common knowledge to people. Oh, absolutely. You know, back in the and day. The, and but the cool thing is that there is the there is the memory that indwells within spirit, so that so that you know you get. You get fragments of it, and you know those who study, those who apply themselves, those who embrace the light, those I, however you want to put it, those who are seekers, um, genuine seekers, not let me read in, or take a class, but but seekers right. who are working in spirit, um, they truly do find what they're looking for, and and you know, it, and it takes longer perhaps than a lot of us would like, but, but the more you work, the more you're able to, to manifest that light within your life. And it does, it does create a vibrancy that is just, it's, I, it's magical. Um, I'm sure there's a better word for it, but magical is what really, to me, makes hopefully people understand that it's beyond your perception until you are, until you have eyes to see. And when you have eyes to see, it's glorious, and you do create heaven right here on earth when you get to that point. And you, they they had it, and you know it, it's a matter of seeking it and and finding it and trying to bring it back to the perception of everyone. I don't know if it's my generation or the next generation or the next generation after that, but but I do know that it's coming. Um, I just noticed the time, and. Um, Oh my we're not goodness. gonna see it we're not gonna see it in the next two minutes, but <laughs> I do I wanna thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful two hours. I am so glad that we got it in. And I'm yeah, gonna have to fun. ask you back again so we can talk more. Oh, you always say that. Everybody every time I get on a show and they like it, they say, Well, we're gonna have to have you back, Ross. And they never call me. <laughs> No, well, I'm it kidding. helps if your phone works, did. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now that you have a working phone, it'll be a lot easier to call you and get you back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be happy to come back sometime. I'd be happy. I to. would love to have you back. Um, you've been a delight, and I do not say that to everybody, by the way. So um, you listen to a whole bunch of my interviews. It's very rare I say you have to come back. Um because because we haven't, you know, there's so much we haven't gotten to that is as important. But um, but for now, I have to say good night and thank you. And, and I so appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule and, and spending it with us and spreading your wisdom. And I there's so much more I have to pump you for. So, yeah, you're coming back. All right, Barbara DeLong. You got it. Okay, <laughs> okay. I love you. Love everybody in your audience. Love your neighbor well, as yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you one. got it. And until then, everybody, thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Can't remember when next time is, but it's sometime next week. And um, 